Up next, folks, we have Faye Flam. Her talk is Crisis in the Media. Can we fight fakers in an accelerating information universe? Uh, Faye Flam is a science journalist who's written for The Economist, Science, New Scientist, uh, the Washington Post, and the Philadelphia Inquirer. She's from my side of the country. She's from Philadelphia, the cool side of the country, which, yeah. Boo, yes. East. Go, go ahead and boo. We don't care. We wear black. It's fine. Um, she also writes the Lightning blog on uh, WHYY, which is the, uh, the, the Philly station that I listen to all the time. So again, crisis in the media, can we fight fakers in an accelerating information universe? Her haiku is, things move so fast now. For example, recently, I fell off a train. Please welcome <laughs> Faye Flan. I thought I'd start with a little um, show-and-tell object. Um, some uh, over a certain age will recognize this. It's a newspaper. This is actually the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer. This is a newspaper that I wrote for for 16, a little over 16 years. And um, I thought this was relevant because a big part of what we do, papers, is uh, investigating claims. And so I thought I would talk a little bit about how newspaper journalists investigate claims, and also um, what uh, we're in danger of losing as this uh, becomes an artifact of the past. I, uh, I started out uh, writing for more science-oriented uh, publications. I it's News, um, New Scientist, and Science, where I was a staff writer. I had a really interesting beat there. I wrote about particle physics and cosmology. And uh, that was actually the beat uh, I would have chosen if I had to choose any. Those fields are really uh, interconnected in a fascinating way. The physicists are trying to figure out uh, what the universe is made of, and the cosmologists are trying to figure out where the universe came from, how it got here, and where, it go where it's going, and they're both trying to figure out what the dark matter is made out of. But I, I, as much as I enjoyed that job, I left uh, to come to a newspaper. I actually moved to Philadelphia to work for the Inquirer. And one of the reasons was that it had a great reputation for investigative journalism. They had just run a, a big series called America, What Went Wrong that uh, was really incredible. It involved uh, digging up all kinds of corruption and examples of corporate welfare and then uh, explained in a very clear way how all of this affected uh, ordinary, hardworking people. So it was really great stuff, and I was, I was honored to get to work for them. And I really liked the idea of being able to write about science for a newspaper. Uh, move ahead, Kara. Um, because uh, I like the diversity of the readership, uh, the people who, you know, everybody read the newspaper. It, it served uh, everybody from university presidents to the people selling hot dogs on the street. And I felt like it was also a great way to reach what I think is a sort of a big middle ground of people between science enthusiasts and sort of true believers, people that are just want to be informed about science and, and have a lot of curiosity, and, and they want to keep up uh, on, on uh, new developments in science as, they want, as we all want to keep up on everything. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, I enjoyed doing the most at the Inquirer was, uh, whoops, there it is, writing up uh, a couple of weekly columns. The last one I did was about evolution. We called it Planet of the Apes. And I, I did it in collaboration with um, our political cartoonist, Tony Auth. And uh, he, he's uh, one of the many Pulitzer Prize winners at the Inquirer. And, uh, also uh, turned out to be a great science illustrator. And I was able to cover all kinds of things in that column, everything from the origin of life to the evolution of sex differences. Uh, one week I might be interviewing historians of science on creationist claims that uh, evolution was a big motivating factor for the Nazis. And the next week I might be uh, questioning Catholic biologists about their belief in the soul and asking them, where exactly in the human lineage uh, did we acquire our souls? Was it uh, during, uh, before or after we branched off from the Neanderthals? So 
So I, I got some very interesting answers on that. Um, but uh, unfortunately, just about the time I joined the Inquirer, uh, it started a kind of long uh, decline. And um, a lot of the readers who didn't like my column very much blamed me. But uh, this was sort of a, uh, a newspaper industry-wide and uh, eventually, the Inquirer uh, ended up, uh, the, the owners bankrupt, and it uh, changed hands a couple of times. And uh, the, the uh, last owners brought in new management, and they didn't like my column very much. They told me I couldn't write it anymore. And that was uh, that gave me a good explanation for it. So that's my cue to look to new things. Oh. We also had a, a lot of opportunities at this, I, I, uh, I missed a slide here, to, uh, to discuss intelligent design and various forms of uh, uh, belief in uh, God of the gaps. And so there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of good discussion of science and religion. And uh, after I left the Inquirer, I started a, a bunch of new ventures. Uh, this is one of them. This is the... Uh, Lightning Rod, uh, it's an online science column for WHYY, uh, the public radio station in Philadelphia. And um, uh, Tony Auth, the illustrator, also left and is now uh, continuing to illustrate my columns here. I also work as a media critic uh, for a site called the Night Science Journalism Tracker, where I sometimes uh, take my colleagues to task either for failing to properly fight fakery or for sometimes adding to the fakery. So uh, I thought I'd uh, just bring in a little anecdote about uh, what kinds of people work for newspapers. Back in the uh, 1990s, when the Inquirer was a huge newspaper and uh, there were a couple of hundred people in the newsroom, uh, one of my colleagues, a medical writer, decided to do an informal survey and he asked all of us two questions. Do we believe in God? And do we believe in an afterlife? And I was surprised to find the results were that almost everybody, about 98% of us, answered no to both questions. And I, that actually makes us, uh, would make us less religiously inclined than scientists, according to some similar surveys, even less religiously inclined than biologists, who are considered to be the least uh, religious among scientists. And some people might think that there was some sort of a bias there, but I think that it's really just a natural consequence of uh, the, the uh, types of people that uh, gravitate toward a newspaper like the Inquirer. I think we were all basically uh, skeptics and uh, the types of people that just don't take uh, people's word for things, but want to check them out for ourselves. And that would include the words of religious figures or uh, industry CEOs, politicians, or even scientists. And as a science reporter, I, a big part of my job was to look at claims. Um, I think it's great that a lot of people want science over superstition. But at the same time, it can, it's not always that easy because uh, sometimes science and fakery get mixed up together. Sometimes fakers of different types hire scientists to put an authentic veneer on what they're doing. Sometimes fakers uh, adopt scientific terminology uh, in order to make their quackery look like science. Sometimes fakers lie about scientific credentials or scientific data. And sometimes scientists uh, may not exactly be fakers, but uh, they can delude themselves. And uh, I actually I have had a lot of really good interactions with the skeptics community in Philadelphia. There's a, a great group there called the Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking. Um, and they've given me some ideas for claims that I thought were worth investigating. I've written about magnet healing, which was a really popular thing back in the 1990s. I think it's, uh, it's still around. Uh, and some of the magnet uh, sellers had a mechanism. They said that the magnets would, uh, would heal you by moving your blood around because supposedly your blood had iron and it would be drawn by a magnet. It's actually pretty easy to test because when the blood isn't in your body, it's not drawn by a magnet. Um, another thing that I, I, I learned about from the local skeptics group was something called therapeutic touch. 
And um, when I first heard about that, I didn't really understand what the big deal was. They were saying, well, you know, it's, it's infiltrating the training of nurses and it's in the nursing books. And um, I thought, yeah, well, I mean, I can see where touching people might be comforting if you're sick. And then I saw a demonstration and I, I understood that uh, there's actually, uh, I don't know, silly me, I thought that there was touching involved, but <laughs> there's actually no, uh, nothing therapeutic and no touching. And uh, fakers can be very creative and, and come up with all kinds of new things, and so there were no shortage of claims to look into. Sometimes we would get ideas from the advertising section of our own paper. And you might think that that would be a, a, a sure route to getting fired, uh, working for a newspaper and then trying to to look into claims in the advertising section. But at that time, the Inquirer was such a powerful, strong paper that, that we didn't really worry about that because if some advertiser pulled an ad, there were more where that, where that one came from. And I, one particularly memorable one I looked into was a company that offered a DNA test and it was supposed to tell you what vitamins you needed. And I thought, well, okay, it's not completely crazy because there are some mutations that can affect uh, the way you absorb certain things. Uh, there's one that affects uh, how you absorb folic acid. So uh, I convinced the inquirer to pay uh, $200 to uh, have me take this test. I uh, did a little cheap cheek swab and I sent my DNA to them. And they, they sent me back uh, the results in a couple of weeks and it, they told me that it was imperative, really kind of urgent, that I, I get on their vitamins right away. And uh, I actually needed, uh, according to them, about $400 a month worth of their special vitamins. Vitamins, okay, so I took my results and I went down to NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and I talked to some geneticists and some people who were experts in nutrition. And they looked at my results and they said, well, you know, these are all just polymorphisms. They're places where um, our uh, DNA varies from person to person. There's really nothing unusual or abnormal here. And not only that, none of these have a thing to do with vitamins. And the, uh, the uh, response from the company was just that I didn't understand the sophistication of their science well enough to be able to write about it. And you know, a lot of these types of things, I, they, they may not kill off the fakers, the fakers will keep going, but I think they do uh, have a, a, a value for society because uh, they can help people understand how the scientific process works. And that's especially true with things like therapeutic touch where there were some really clever uh, experiments designed to uh, put these things to scientific tests. So they can help show people uh, how scientists think, how to design a proper experiment. And, uh, think about mechanisms and sort of why a claim may or may not turn out to be scientific. I think it can be particularly dangerous when fakery gets mixed up with science because people really do put a lot of trust in science. They may not understand science very well, but they tend to believe things when they come from people they think are scientists. And that can be particularly problematic in court cases uh, when scientists uh, act as expert witnesses. And one case that I looked into for a story involved somebody who had been in prison for more than 50 years for murder, and there were some forensic scientists and lawyers who thought he didn't belong there, thought that uh, there was never a good case against him. And so I, I read huge stacks of court transcripts and, and did some research on this case, and I found that Indeed, the main reason he was in there was the testimony of a, a sort of a celebrity scientist. Her name was Agnes Malatrat, and Agnes Malatrat was written up in women's magazines and in newspaper feature sections as this sort of uh, amazing female sleuth who always got the, the uh, evidence against the guy that the police wanted. And that right there is a little bit suspicious. Um, it turned out that in a subsequent trial, um, the uh, opposing lawyer looked into her background and found that she was uh, not, in fact, a scientist at all. She had lied on her resume. She had no science background and hadn't even graduated from high school. And they, they actually did a second trial, and the lawyers convinced the jury that the science that she did was still good, even if she didn't have the right credentials. So uh, you know, that was the interesting question to me, was what science did she do? What did they really have? 
And it turned out what they had was she, she would go to the crime scene or to, in this case, there was a body that was found out in an alleyway and she would collect a whole bunch of stuff. This was before there was DNA fingerprinting. So they'd look at hairs and fibers and things and she'd collect a lot of things. And then she'd go to the suspect's house and she'd look all over and see if she could find things that looked similar. And so, you know, the relevant question here is, well, what are the odds that if you took a lot of samples of stuff from a crime scene that you could find something similar in somebody's house. And she never said, no one ever said. The jury was never told that. There were no controls. And uh, you know, they often use the term match, which I think can be pretty misleading. And I don't know if uh, that, how much that story contributed to what happened later, but uh, three or four months after it ran, um, the uh, guy was released. Um, another claim that I looked into as a science writer, uh, this was back in 2002, was the claim that uh, Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, and this was something that we should be worried about. And I, I considered this a scientific claim, a science-related story, because there were scientists, there were physicists who had gone to Iraq as UN weapons inspectors, and uh, a lot of them had uh, learned quite a bit about what was going on with the Iraqi nuclear weapons program and uh, what the rate limiting steps were uh, toward their being able to make a bomb. And I remember distinctly one of those physicists telling me that he thought the term weapons of mass destruction was a term of propaganda. And I asked him why that was and he said, well, you know, if, we were, if, if they were specific and said there were chemical weapons, then people would question whether that was really a reason to go to war since other countries had those and we weren't at war with them. And if they were specific and said there were nuclear weapons, then people might ask more specific questions about uh, the centrifuges and about how long it would actually take for them to build up enough nuclear fuel to make a weapon. And uh, the scientists said it was actually, it would take quite a long time from where they were at that point. I think that that illustrates a kind of a common tactic that you see when people are trying to mislead that they tend to try to be as vague and fuzzy as possible and not, not be specific about their claims. And that kind of blurring out of claims came up again in a story, uh, an issue that uh, got labeled Climate Gate. This was uh, a couple of years ago. Some of you, uh, this, this came up in, in an earlier talk. There were uh, a group of climate scientists who had a huge number of their emails stolen by hackers. And then a group of people who called themselves skeptics claimed that these mainstream climate scientists were fakers. So who were the real fakers here? Well, as, as part of the reporting on that story, I, I called one of the most vocal uh, opponents of global warming, a guy named Patrick Michaels, and I think he actually does have some science background. And I asked him to tell me the very worst thing that they found in those emails. And his first reaction was, well, I can't do that because there were so many. There were, there were thousands. And I, I said, so, so you, you're telling me that because somebody stole thousands of emails from them, that means they did something wrong. So that's, that's your evidence. Or is it that they wrote thousands of emails? That that, and, and he said, no, OK, OK, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. And, and he hung up on me. Um, then he, he actually called me back a few hours later. And he said, OK, OK, here it is. Here's the worst thing. He said two of the scientists nominated each other for an American Geophysical Union fellowship. And I said, that's, that's it? That's, that's the best you got out of all those emails? And he said, well, don't you think that's unethical? And I said, well, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously not compared to falsely accusing people of uh, scientific fraud, no. <laughs> so, I mean, it seemed like that was hardly enough to bring down the whole scientific uh, field of, of climatology. I think those last two stories really illustrate something that, that we did at newspapers that, that it is not done so much anymore, and that's direct confrontation. That, uh, you know, I, I, it's not false balance, but sometimes you really do need to go to people and try to pin them down, try to confront them and get them to really explain themselves. And I think also there's a lot of value in talking directly to people. There are so many uh, stories now just use quotes that people find in Google, but you never really know uh, the context of those quotes, why those people said those things, or even whether they said them at all. 
And I also think that takes care of the problem of civility that some people have discussed earlier in the meeting. I think if you go to people and give them a chance to explain themselves and confront them, that that's a really more productive approach than just calling them names or saying that they're stupid or that they're wrong. And uh, the issue of direct confrontation uh, and, and personal interviews came up again in another story. Um, you might remember when there was a claim that NASA had discovered arsenic-based life. And this one, a lot of skeptics kind of fell for, though it wasn't exactly what it was, uh, it was made out to be. Um, and the first suspicious thing about it was that it, it came out in a, a big journal, Science, but normally when uh, reporters get uh, a little uh, sort of advance notice on papers like that, they, the lead researchers actually have their contact information there, and even really, really prominent famous scientists will agree to do press interviews. But this team wouldn't do it. They, they wouldn't grant anybody an interview. And instead they gave a big press conference. And the press conference was not very informative. They spent the whole time talking about how important their finding was, but very little time talking about what exactly they found, what their evidence was, and no, no time at all talking about the limitations of their science. And weirder than that, they kept talking about a shadow biosphere. And the shadow biosphere is a term that scientists sometimes use to describe uh, a hypothetical form of life that didn't spring from the same origin as the life we know. Um, evolution tells us that all life, uh, all known life sprung from a common origin, so it would be incredibly exciting and profound to find an example of a shadow biosphere. So I thought it was just kind of weird that these uh, scientists were spending a lot of time at their press conference talking about something that was incredibly exciting that they didn't find. But uh, we in the media don't always get things right. Uh, and I've noticed some patterns uh, in the ways that the thing has often come out wrong. And one of the things that I thought was particularly weird about the way newspaper people think was that editors would tell us that the amount of time we should spend on a story should be proportional to the length of the story. And that might sort of make sense if we spent most of our time writing, but we really don't. We spend almost all our time investigating things. And then usually you don't start writing until you can feel the, the editor's breath on the back of your neck. And that's, you know, it's not really, it's sort of a, a, a positive form of procrastination because you really want to get as much information as you possibly can before the deadline of a story. You want to make sure you're right. You want to check things. Most, most journalists don't have outside fact checkers, we are our own fact checkers, so we're, we want to make sure we really know what we're saying before it, it actually gets out there. But what that, that means then is that big long pieces did take a lot of research and a, and a lot went into it. But if you read a little short piece, then uh, you can assume that very little time actually went into checking whether uh, what you're reading is true. And I think that's, that problem has gotten worse as the perception has grown that, that readers only want little short things, that they don't have any attention span, that they just want little short blurbs and briefs and, and things on that order. And I think that leads to another problem, which is the blurring of the lines between PR and journalism, because a lot of these little short things, people just end up copying something off a press release. And sometimes there are also uh, aggregator sites that present press releases and journalistic stories mixed up. And, and there is a distinction. It's not that, um, that journalists are necessarily objective because we're, we're human. We're allowed to care about people that we write about. But uh, you know, if, if I write a story about somebody trying to cure cancer, I'm allowed to care whether that person succeeds as a human being. What I'm not allowed to do is care because I own stock in the company that's making the drug. And I think that that actually is an important difference. We, we get fired if we could benefit financially from the people that we're writing about or we got paid by the people we're writing about. And PR people are paid by the people they're writing about. So where are we going now? Um, uh, one of the jobs that I've taken on since I left the Enquirer was a, uh, to become a journalism critic for a site called the Knight Science Journalism Tracker. And it's a very interesting site. It's funded by the Knight Foundation, and four of us look over what's going on in the science journalism world, and we write about what's good and what might be uh, hyped or exaggerated or where some of our colleagues make mistakes. And there actually is a lot of good stuff still out there, so a lot of positive things to say. but. Um, 
Actually, the story here, this, uh, if you look closely, this is a, a jellyfish, um, which was made famous in the New York Times Magazine. There was a big story called something about the immortal jellyfish. And I actually got a lot of people emailing me this story and putting it up on my Facebook page, saying, look, you gotta see this. You might have even done it. You know, immortal jellyfish, amazing. But if you read this, or actually if you really read the New York Times story carefully to the end, you'll find it's not really immortal. Oh. It's this one, right? It's the little jellyfish. Oh, well, I'm sorry. It's not up? Oh, OK. <laughs> All right. There's the immortal jellyfish. It's not really immortal. Um, and I thought I'd end by talking about uh, one of the posts that I wrote for the tracker that they kind of changed the way I approach things and sort of pulled me back from, I think, contributing to all this information pollution as opposed to trying to sift through it. And it started with, uh, with this cat. Um, this cat plays a role in it. This is, this is my cat. His name is Higgs. Um, he used to be an alley cat. Uh, he fell on hard times, and he came to live with me. And somehow, I, he inspired me to create a, a fictional character who wrote some of my Philadelphia Inquirer evolution columns. And uh, I started him out by uh, answering some of the hate mail I got from creationists. And he did a really good job. Actually, the, the post that he wrote got a lot more hits online than I ever got. He actually was like up there with the sports and the gossip blogs when, when he appeared. I mean, I guess I would like to also think of him as, as one of those honest liars, um, because he doesn't really need those glasses. <laughs> And um, Higgs was also sort of good for um, discussing evolution from the point of view of another branch on the tree of life. Um, because one of the big misconceptions I found that a lot of people had, even people who, who had learned evolution and, and liked evolution, is that they thought that the purpose of evolution was to create people, or that people are sort of the top of the evolutionary tree. And so, so Higgs was really good at, at reminding people that Evolution really isn't all about us. And so I, I had a lot of fun uh, writing about Higgs, but uh, when the column was canceled, unfortunately, he lost his job too. Um, but I ended up finding a new job for him um, with Parade. An editor at Parade actually wanted to hire Higgs as their science cat. And I actually sort of got this uh, idea that maybe um, you know we could present him as the world's smartest cat, and eventually you know he could replace the uh, Ask Marilyn column. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not. Um, I, sometimes I think this is the journalistic equivalent to, to me wearing a clown suit. <laughs> But it, it actually started out pretty well, and I was able to, to kind of create the voice of the character in the same way I had done for the Philadelphia Inquirer. But it just wasn't getting the same traction. I think that part of that is that the parade website was almost all uh, either recipes or beauty tips or celebrity gossip. So it just didn't attract the kinds of readers who would like this sort of thing. And so it, it just wasn't really picking up a, an online following. And I, I talked to my editor there about it. And I said, well, you know, is there something you can do? Can you advertise it or something? And he said, well, you know, what would really help is if you wrote uh, every day, you know, if you just put something in there, like a link to something else. And I thought, you know, that's not really what I do, but I guess I could. And I, 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 it lasted about a day, because I, I picked something I thought would be reliable. I picked up a, a link from uh, a blog called uh, Kroll Witch Wonders, which is an NPR blog. And actually, Robert Kroll Witch has a, a really interesting show. And I thought, OK, well, this is pretty reliable. It was also a really interesting post about how you lose a little bit of weight uh, overnight without doing anything, just uh, in the form of carbon that you breathe out with carbon dioxide. And I thought, well, it's really, you know, really thought provoking and interesting. It makes people think a little bit differently about the way the body works. As people sort of don't sometimes think, like, if you lose weight, where exactly does the mass go? Um, but then I thought, you know, it was so interesting, I would write a post for the uh, Night Science Journalism Tracker as well. And um, I, that, that's such a serious thing that I looked into it a little more closely. And when I read it carefully, I realized that Krollwich was claiming that we lose 
more than a pound of carbon. We breathe out more than a pound of carbon overnight. And that was part of the reason that his, his post was getting a lot of attention. And I thought, that seems a little high. A pound? <laughs> Could that really be? So I, I actually called a friend of mine who's a chemist. And I thought of a couple ways we might be able to sort of do a back of the envelope calculation. And, and we did that. And it came out to something more like a little fraction of a pound, maybe a, a less than a quarter of a pound. And when I went back to the original source that Robert Krulwich used, it was a really interesting um, video blog uh, called Veritasium, actually something out of Australia. Um, really good blog. And, and the guy that did that actually got it right. Somehow he said, yeah, it's a, it's a fraction of a pound. And he did a, a controlled, kind of interesting experiment where he would weigh himself at night and in the morning. And then he did it a few times. And he was, said he was very, very careful not to go to the bathroom in between the two wings. <laughs> and then he found he actually didn't lose very much weight. He lost maybe a, you know, between a half and a quarter of a pound. Um, and that, you know, that made, uh, I think Higgs and I thought maybe we had discovered something, a, uh, a connection here. Uh, that uh, Higgs would thought, you know, maybe, you know, 90% of everything really belongs in the litter box, whether it's uh, the weight you lose overnight or uh, stuff you find on the web. But I found that Higgs and I hadn't actually discovered this. Somebody else discovered it. Um, Sturgeon's Law. <laughs> And uh, I don't want to end on this sort of a negative note here. So I thought I would say just that. Um, I'd originally thought I would say that I think that the skeptics community and reporters like me are really kindred spirits. But I thought that's not the right, maybe they're not the right expression to use. So uh, instead, I'll say I think we have a lot to offer each other. Oh, and I also wanted to say that I was really flattered that you put my name on your t-shirt. So I thought that was. Uh, <laughs> A really nice touch, but you spelled the first name wrong, so just, just for next year. <laughs> Thank you. Faye Flynn.